Yeah. Basically, we were um, got the shot straight away because it was newcomers. We led by some students. <coughs> well, not that we didn't know as much. It was sort of the adventure of us. We got to climb up all these muddy banks, you know. Yeah. And my shoe was good. Not really, no, but then. And try, I mean, it was just a conference, you know, for um, an expedition. So, then I got there anyway. I told you this is a bit of a you have the swapping boots and so on. So those trousers are So I walked to the minister. It's an two years and two hours. Yeah, it's like it's just, you know, he's just yeah, and it's also friendly, you know, it's just having a little happy flower. Yeah, that's what, that's what, yeah, it's a great, yes, there is a piece of bread, but it's still needs to be shot, I saw it. Anyway, great, that's my summer. I like it, I like it. I just saw it, I 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 saw it, she said it took her six months to do it. Well, I don't know. I I don't know. I I don't know. I I don't I don't know. I I I I I I I I I some of them are I just go on and on to the <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I,
Making sure all the papers are in the front. I'm very tired. Why do you think that's the dialogue? Yeah. <laughs> 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 So this is so <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we do <laughs> right, good evening everybody. Um, welcome to the Dio Anglo Japanese Foundation. I'm glad our air conditioning is working nicely, so it should be nice and cool in here. So um, this evening uh, we have we're going to be introducing this book, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, which is by Natasha Pulley. Um, and I feel a sense of pride in doing this because Natasha is one of our Daiwa scholars. Um, we sent her to Japan in 2013. She spent about 18 months there <laughs> learning Japanese and doing various other things, including I think writing this book. Some of it. Yeah. Uh, some, <laughs> some of this book. Um, so, and uh, I was involved in selecting her, as was, uh, as in fact were several members of the audience. Um, so we're now about to see the, the fruits of her labours. Um, just before she starts, can I do my housekeeping announcements, which are, um, if the fire alarm happens to go off, please don't use the lift. You have to go down the stairs, out the front door, and we congregate on the park side of the um, street. And then I'm supposed to just check everybody who's signed in has got out. Um, so don't run away. Um, and the second thing is don't leave any valuables in our folk rooms downstairs because nobody is watching them. So if you've got a laptop in a bag or something, I would suggest you just pop down and pick it up. So anyway, I'm going to hand over to Natasha, but I'll just give you a brief blurb that she's written for me. Um, she uh, read English language and literature at Oxford University and then went on to the creative writing course at the University of East Anglia, which has produced so many well-known uh, writers. And it was shortly after that that uh, our interests in hers coincided. Um, we wanted to get a very good writer uh, on our program, uh, 
and she wanted to go to Japan, and perhaps she'll tell us why. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. It's really lovely of you. It's great to see so many people here, even though you don't know who I am, which is brilliant. <laughs> um, so, this is a book um, about a watchmaker who can remember the future. He is a Japanese immigrant. He comes from Meiji period Japan to 1880s London. Um, there is a good spoonful of fantasy in this book. Uh, there is a plot of a octopus and weather control. But there are a lot of real things too. And of course, one of the things I'd like to talk about today is mm, why Japan, considering that I knew nothing about Japan when I started writing this book. But before I do that, um, I'd like to read just a very short extract. And I'm not going to begin at the beginning because that would be very dull. I'm going to read the part where the watchmaker is introduced. Now, what's just happened in the novel is that the narrator, Daniel, has just escaped a bombing that destroyed Scotland Yard. It was a real bombing. It happened in May 1884. Um, and it's the reason why we now have new Scotland Yard rather than just Scotland Yard. Um, before the bombing, he received a mysterious watch. And he's been ambivalent about it for a while. But after the bombing, in which the watch alarm has saved his life, he's decided to go in search of the maker. Right. Filigree Street was a medieval row of houses whose upper stories leaned toward each other. At its far end, the gap between the gables became so small that people standing in opposite bedroom windows could have shaken hands. It was too dark to see house numbers, but number 27 was obvious because it was the only shop still alight. In the window, a single lamp illuminated a clockwork model of the city that grew <coughs> new towers and bridges until it became London. When he opened the door, it was unlocked. There was no bell. Hello? He called into the empty workshop. His voice was spiderweb from cracks. Electric lights hummed on as soon as he came in and he stopped still, not sure what he had done to turn them on and waiting, his spine stiff for something else. The lights were set into the ceiling in looping rows. He had only ever seen them at the illuminations never in anyone's house. The filaments glowed orange dress, and then a yellowy white, much brighter than a gas lamp. The fizz of the electricity made him set his teeth. It sounded wrong in the same way that the great river attracts a Victoria station felt wrong. But nothing else happened except, at last, the fraction of brightening. In the new light, everything around him shone, Across the wall behind him was a tall pendulum clock, its movement regulated by the jointed wings and knees of the golden locust, a mechanical model that the solar system spun in midair, floating on magnets, and up two steps in the tiered floor, little bronze birds sat perched on the edge of the desk. One of them hopped onto the microscope and tapped its beak hopefully on the brass fittings. Things glimmered and clicked everywhere. There was a sign by the door, room to let, within. He was about to call out again when, behind the desk, another door opened. A small man with blonde hair came through, backwards, because he was carrying on two cups of tea. When he turned around, he nodded good evening. He had slanted eyes. Oriental. Daniel Flounder. Oh, uh, do you speak English? <coughs> of course I do, I live in England, said the man. He held out one of the cups. His hands were thin, his skin the colour that Daniel would have turned after a week in the sun. See, it's horrible outside. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, so, um, I started to write this story about seven years ago. And as I say, I didn't know anything about Japan at the time, really. Um, I knew about what I think most teenagers know, in that I'd written, no, sorry, I'd seen lots of Japanese sci-fi, kind of anime, that kind of thing. So I was hearing the language, but I knew very, very little about the culture. I did, definitely didn't know anything about modern Tokyo. So why, in heaven's name, did 
I decided to write about Japan or a Japanese character not knowing anything. One of the reasons is that the book is set in 19th century London. And what I really wanted was a foreigner, and not just a kind of generally European somebody, but someone who would really stand out and look different in the middle of Victorian England. That's facile, but there's a very strong urge to write about a main character who looks a bit different. And I think it's the way a lot of writers will focus attention. If the reader reads in the way that a camera does, in the way that a camera observes, what part of the writer's job is to focus that lens. And an easy way to do it is to give them a visual cue, like somebody who's a bit different than <coughs> And of course, if you have somebody who stands out, they're plainly important. The other way, obviously, is to write at length about somebody ordinary looking, but it feels kind of sometimes, especially in fantasy, a lot more efficient to just have someone who looks striking. So that, that was reason one, bad reason one. But the second reason really um, is to do with fantasy and to do with the genre that I'm interested in. Having a main character who isn't local is important because especially in fantasy, foreignness leads, well, it lends authenticity and plausibility to the story. I mean, that sounds strange, but it's very interesting to look at medieval stories of men with no heads or two heads or, or one enormous leg. They often say that these things live in China, and of course the Chinese say that they live in Europe. And I think it's quite nice to imagine a couple of people meeting one day in the middle of the Silk Road being quite disappointed that the other hasn't got any cyclops with them. But yeah, fiction must live in the places that you don't know about. This is the point. As far as anyone knows, that way, it could really be true. And I think this happens in even the most basic kinds of storytelling. You look at fairy tales, it's very interesting, they tend to happen at <coughs> night or at twilight. Of course, these are times when you cannot see properly, which is important. They also tend to be set heavily in forests and wide forests. And I have a small theory that the forest, especially in the kind of world in which fairy tales are set, when London is only the size of central Oxford now. The forest was one of the few places where you could go where your line of sight was so abbreviated that you might not be able to find the same spot twice. Being lost is important. Not knowing where you are and being able to see is important. So this naturally carries also into fantasy writing, which is very closely related to fairy tales. Um, and on that note, the Far East is, for English writing, a great place to set anything strange. It's a nice place to put all the unicorns, really. Even in high fantasy novels, it's, um, if you look at the characters, you can do something unusually odd, even for high fantasy. You think about Lord of the Rings. Elvish culture is based on, well, Elvish culture and language, is based on Old Welsh, Medieval Welsh, whereas the more familiar cultures come back to Old English. So it's just kind of making strange, making foreign. Game of Thrones, characters like Lady Melisandre are very foreign. And if you think about the rhetoric of Victorian magicians, even, it really hammers it in. And I think the wisdom of an, of an ambiguous and undefined East always really seems to top the wisdom of kind of Jim, who lives at number four, because it might actually be wisdom. So there's this huge drive to use something where the fantasy could possibly actually live. And for Victorian England, Japan is a place like that. It is one of these kind of strange foresty places that nobody knows about. It was really, I think, one of the most unknown places in the world. And the reason I think this is partly just to do with how very difficult it was to go there and how difficult it was to come here from there. Before the building, for example, of the Suez Canal, it took about two and a half months to reach Yokohama from London, and this is via Hong Kong. And I found it quite hard to think of anything now that takes two and a half months, but I can't think of a journey in the world that takes that long. So I went on the NASA website, and a few years ago it took two and a half months for the New Horizons probe to reach the orbit of Mars. So this is the kind of the distance that people were thinking about at the time with regards to the difference between London and Japan. Now, of course, these are kind of silly reasons for setting something in a particular country. But I find that a very 
charming characteristic of historical fiction, which is kind of also is, is that if an idea is plausible, it tends to have happened somewhere in real life. Now, I didn't know when I decided to make the watchmaker Japanese if there even were any Japanese people living in London in the 1880s. Um, but in fact, there were. There was a Japanese show village in the corner of Hyde Park, um, a Knightsbridge. It was part of the Great Exhibition and it opened in 1884. It was in a building called Humphreys Hall. Um, and what they did was they brought about 100 Japanese artisans over from Japan with their families. They constructed a perfect replica wooden show village, modelled after the street in Japan. Um, and there, the artisans made their work. They made things like pottery, they made parasols, everything like that. Interestingly, you couldn't buy it. It was more like a museum. Um, but they also had a cafe that served real green tea. And everyone who worked there was required to wear traditional dress. So it really was an exhibit of the foreign. And its claim to fame, of course, is that Gilbert and Sullivan went there to research the Nicado. So I stole all that <laughs> and put it in the book. And then I felt quite lucky that I'd managed to hit on something that really happened. And I thought that this was a kind of one-off <coughs> thing, that I'd just been incredibly lucky. But in fact, I find it happens a lot. And just to kind of deviate a little bit, it happened very recently as well. I was writing a, a story a few months ago when I really hemmed myself in at the end. And it, this sounds ridiculous, it needed a Western ship to have been shipwrecked off the coast of Japan in 1605. Yeah, good luck there. 1605, the story was set, it had to be 1605. So I sort of started trawling on Google in a very hopeless sort of way and stumbled over the East India Company records. And honestly, there was a ship. <laughs> there really was. It was part of the fleet of four. And I was a bit annoyed because three of them had kind of wonderful names, like the Red Dragon, the one that I realized would actually fit my purpose was called the Susan. Not so good. But I haven't changed the name. I'm going to keep it. What was happening was a fleet of these four ships were doing a pepper run to Java. And they did, one of them disappeared on the way back. The Susan disappeared. Japan, obviously, is not between here and Java. But at the time, the route wasn't known for it, <coughs> and every ship was required to bring up to seven anchors with them because they lost them so often because the surface, the, the, the bed of the sea was so unknown that they often snapped anchor chains, anchor ropes and things like that. But according to the same regulations, you only had to have three anchor ropes. That sounds odd from seven anchors, three anchor ropes. I think it was to do with ballast, how much they could actually fit on the ship. But, so my theory, my theory is, Japan was the only place apparently at the time in that region where you could come across a decent anchor rope. It was the only place where they made a proper rope that wouldn't snap almost immediately or rot. It was the only place this is documented by the East India Company. My idea is the Susan has gone through all three anchors. They go up towards Japan to try and get another anchor rope. Feasible that they might have had to divert feasible that they might have been shipwrecked. Fantastic. No one from that ship was ever seen again, so I can kind of make it up. This is great. And I think this, is, this sort of thing is why a lot of writers will say that historical fiction kind of writes itself. It isn't really that you're following anyone's particular biography. It's that if you're thinking down the right track, what you want usually exists somewhere. Anyway. So I found out all this marvellous stuff about the Great Exhibition and Gilbert and Sullivan and by that time Japan was quite suddenly in the book for reasons much better than just like happened to one at Warwick. So I went and did my MA at this point, I, I kind of had this. And the first thing that everyone said was, you need to set some chapters in Japan! And panic ensued because I didn't know anything. Now it's really easy to find out information about Victoria in London just because it's kind of all on one website, it's called victorianlondon.org, which has everything from encyclopedia entries to extracts from newspapers. And as far as I know, a resource of that kind does not exist in English, but maybe Japan. So I went around reading old articles from the Japan Times. I read Ernest Satter's diaries, and I, I Wikipedia bits in between, particularly. Um, and it was in this haphazard way that I started to find out just how much Japan was changing in the second half of the 19th century. And I think one of the reasons that steampunk is interesting, that Victorian England is interesting, 
is that for the first time in history, people must use on a daily basis machines and mechanisms that they don't stand. Science fiction is blossoming, the improvement of the world seems to be happening astronomically quickly. But I really don't think that that's a patch on what's going on in Tokyo at the time. And one of the most interesting things that I found out about the early major period is castle abolition in the 1870s. It sounds ridiculous, but some of the wealthiest samurai clans in Japan had their castles forced forth with government bonds in return to the possession of the state. And including some of the largest and most wonderful castles in the country. Some were used as garrisons, some were destroyed. But the reason that this really struck me so much was that I think that there's a comparable event in English history, and of course that is the dissolution of the monsters. Now, I find it bizarre to imagine Thomas Cromwell not only knocking down abbeys, but trying to push through legislation that would allow steam trains to run between Whitehall and Windsor. But trying to imagine that, I think, gives a real flavour on what was dumped onto the Prime Minister's plate at the beginning of the major period. Comparisons like that are obviously superficial, but I think they're very important at the same time. What it does is it helps to translate culture. And I think one of the biggest barriers for imagining how something happens, castles being knocked down by the government in the late 19th century, is you find it completely inexplicable. Whereas if there's some even vague parallel with something that you, you know that's familiar, it really helps to make clear what the motives might have been and what people might have felt about it, which of course is one of the most important things to consider in any kind of fiction writing. This, this is not a documentary. Um, and one of the things I found myself doing when I was learning Japanese is to try and find these parallels with English, just to kind of keep myself from going insane. <coughs> and I think kanji are a wonderful example. And I, well, I was talking about this a minute ago. I think for a beginner learner of Japanese, it seems ridiculous that there are almost two languages, one native Japanese for simple things, and one for politicians and academics, which is just kind of flattened Chinese, and I still can't understand after a year and a half learning. I'm not happy. Um, it seems bonkers, but until you compare that to the way that English uses Latin and Greek, as soon as you do that, it becomes more manageable. <coughs> it ties into something you already know. And I think translating a language is a very well-known thing, but translating history and events and cultural quirks is, is just as useful. But it would be difficult to do any kind of discussion of Japan and what I think about Japan without talking about the tea ceremony and why I found it really irritating. <laughs> An example of why it's important to translate kind of just happened at me after about a year. And it absolutely went into this book. So I spent a long time feeling very grumpy about the endless Japanese collections of dolls, the way to do things, the sado, chado, kendo. Chinko dolls, one of our school textbooks, insisted on the way of chinko. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd been really early on to a, a kind of flower arranging do, and it was full of ladies in the most beautiful kimono I've ever seen, taking perfect photographs of what I swear are the most rubbish and boring flower arrangements I've ever seen. Yeah, it was incredibly dull. A few weeks after that, well, one of my Japanese acquaintances started talking to me at length about the great virtue of learning the tea ceremony and how important this is to Japanese culture, even though it just it definitely does not take 20 years to make one cup of tea, it just doesn't. So, after a few months, this was actually starting to become a bit of a cultural block for me, because I was starting to, to feel as though these endless dolls, endless ways of things, that they embodied a kind of a nasty pedantry that I was starting to come across just in daily life, things like the, the endless five-hour stint of the, the ward office, which we all so enjoyed. Yeah. And it made me start thinking that you know, I'm in this country of, of, of insane jobs for it. And that nobody could have a hobby that wasn't policed by 600,000 rules. But, of course, I completely misunderstood. And it was all illuminated perfectly when someone pointed out to me that the tea ceremony is a lot like ballet. It is to tea making what ballet is to walking. And there's a particular way of doing it, quite arbitrary, really, but 
and perhaps not too late with the practicalities of boiling a kettle, but it's that method, not the tea that takes 20 years. Now, I've never looked at ballet as an inefficient form of locomotion. And of course, it suddenly seemed ridiculous that I'd been thinking about the tea ceremony just in terms of walking tea. And all at once, that comparison made something that had annoyed me unreasonably before seem very, very beautiful. Which kind of leads on to this notion that we have often, that Japanese as a language and culture is kind of unreachable from a Western perspective. We, we grow up here in, in England that it's a very difficult thing to learn. And this kind of odd implication that Eastern culture is chock full of things we just never think about in the West. And there are some terrifying statistics. Apparently, learning from English, it would take 80,000 study hours, which is about 20 years, to become fully fluent in Japanese, whereas to study fluently in a language like Dutch, it would take more like 4,000, which is only a couple of years. And I know, of course, culture clashes are common. It makes it seem as though there's this very basic difference in the way that people think. But what I found almost unfailingly is that whenever anything odd crops up, whether it's linguistic or cultural, it's very rare indeed that there is no parallel whatsoever in English or in Western culture. It's just a matter of thinking about it in the right way. And it's important to find those parallels. <coughs> it's all part of the process of translating which in turn is part of the process of understanding, of course. Right, so having done all this, written about a character whose nationality I've chosen because it was exotic, what I ended up doing actually was making every effort to make him as less than exotic as possible. Because one of the reasons uh, that I think we have culture clashes is often this expectation of exoticism. And it's a, exoticism, I think, is almost this, a failure to translate properly. So in the end, I wrote about a Japanese man who speaks with a Lincolnshire accent. <laughs> so I really hope that you enjoy the book, if you've not read it already. Honestly, no pressure. <laughs> um, please, I can't do a very good Lincolnshire accent, but when you read more and hear a northern voice, that's quite important to me. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Do some Q and A then. Yeah, okay. I, I might just move here so that I can sit down. Um, does anyone have any questions about the book writing processes? It can generally be. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. this is a really silly. I just I don't know what Stephen Cook is. Ah, okay. and every time I read about your book, I see the term Stephen. Okay, so Stephen is um is quite an odd branch of science fiction. Um, it's a branch of science fiction that romanticizes uh, late 19th century um, machines. It's things like light bulbs, it's the kind of the amazingly technical mind goggles, it's trains, steam engines, everything like that. Um, <coughs> and really, for me, steampunk is a kind of new form of fairy tale. Fairy tales have their special objects, they have things like mirrors, rings. And wishing wells, and often these things, um, when you look at them, you can't quite see how they work. And steampunk objects, or, or how they're made, for example, is, is still, I, I don't know how mirrors are made still, I don't know how mirrors are made still, and I'm sure that the people in the time in which fairy tales are often set, these were kind of very confusing moments as well. We have a new round of those steampunk objects. I, I sort of talked about this very briefly, but I think in the late 19th century, the first time ever, People have to use things like watches, they have to use trains, they have to eventually use light bulbs, even though to a layman it's impossible to see how these things work. Um, and that's important for things like science fiction because as soon as you can't see how something works, you can slightly mysticize it. You can say that it does something that it doesn't, you can say that it works in a way it doesn't. And most people won't be able to correct it. You'll know it's probably wrong, but they won't be able to say how it's wrong. That's really important for fiction. But that is what steampunk is. It's this very late 19th century mm -hmm. odd kind of sci-fi. Yeah. Yes. How important is it to pin down a specific event in history if you're writing about that period? You, you talked about the 1605 shipwreck. Sure. 
and that it was actually the key that we found the ship there oh, because of the kind of just from 1605. Yeah. Why not 1602? How important is that specificity? I think, of course, it's very different for different people. I think it's some historical fiction writers who say, no, I'm, I'm really happy to just take something from one day and move it to another day and it just kind of up a little bit. The reason that I'm so concerned about it is that what I write isn't just historical fiction, it's also fantasy. And in order for the fantasy, me, to seem in any way convincing, everything else has to be perfectly accurate. I would really like to fit it into the excellent gaps between true historical events. And I feel that like this is what gives fantasy and historical fiction great. <coughs> if you just replace true historical events with something that didn't happen, and you've got fantasy in the world, you start with lazy very quickly because it really looks as though you've decided that you don't want to research very much and you fill in the gaps with fairies. I really didn't want to write that kind of historical fantasy. Um, I wanted to write something very, very accurate, very popular. So for me, that's why it's so important. Um, I was <coughs> interested in what you're saying about um, Japan as Seamless is the exoticization of Japan, yeah. uh, which I think is a fascinating subject. Um, Gulliver's Travels, which I think was published in 1767, or something like that, am I right? I think it was, yeah. Um, it contains uh, chapters on the different problems that are put into completely fictitious countries. The only real country is Japan. Yes. Yeah. It's a very short chapter. It's about um, a paragraph, I think. It's very, very short. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and you don't, obviously, you don't know much about it, but you know, this is a sort of curious fiction. Uh, of Japan, but there's something there. And, and, and so Japan becomes some sort of exotic, you know, what you like, 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 tiny people, and huge people, yeah. together, and the Japanese. Now, I remember going, I mean, not remember, Korea, so Korea, um, there is a folk village. Um, this was so on the soul. And I was taking that words. And, um, it's full of uh, ancient Korea, and, and, but all, all the, the staff are dressed in, in uh, 15th century, 18th century dress and so on. And they've got all sorts of, you know, they're doing things they would have done in those days. And, and here's, you know, exoticizing ancient Korea until the best closes of privacy to the name. And you see these people going off dressed in t shirts and jeans on motorbikes. Yeah. And, and that is a very, very disillusioned thing to see. I know, it's so <laughs> weird. And this, this was happening in the Japanese show village in Victoria and London as well. The staff were required to speak Japanese and they were required to, to wear the full kimono. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the children there had English nannies, so first language like, English. They're kind of running around and they couldn't speak Japanese, even though they were, they were supposed to be there as this kind of wonderful <laughs> No, definitely. I think one of the interesting things, you mentioned Gulliver's Travels, one of the really interesting things about that is that uh, Swift says that Gulliver actually went into Japan, but obviously when the book is set, this is like in the middle of the topic hour period, when definitely couldn't have gone into Japan. Um, and I, yeah, it's, I think one of the things that kind of concerns us so much with uh, Japan uh, with regard to the exotic is that it seems in many ways a kind of parallel culture to English. It's an island culture. Its language works in a, in a fairly similar way. They have this, they have a similar attitude towards adopting language customs from other larger cultures. So they adopt from China in the same way that they adopt from Greece and Rome. And I think it's very easy to see parallels. And particularly for the Victorians, I think, there was this wonderful romanticism and the idea that there was still a country where there were knights on horseback. And they weren't just, you know, Pretend knights, they were real, <coughs> real medieval knights, and they come from a country that is not poor. They're not like that because of unfortunate financial economic circumstances. Japan is a huge leader to be here, yet still operates in this fantastic way that looks as if it might be a window into seeing the past. That's one of my theories. <laughs> Sorry, well, I interrupted you before you actually no, 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 Certainly, certainly. Yes, at the back. 
that about my research and uh, some curation program about, about uh, reading the diaries and newspapers. I wonder, uh, did, you, did you see something interesting in Japanese photography? Do you have some I don't know, favorite Japanese photographer from this 19th century? This Japanese photography is really interesting in this time. So I wonder if you were inspired also by images. Definitely images. Um, there, there were two very interesting images that I looked at when I was researching this. One was taken in Japan, and it's um, a photograph, and it must have been in black and white, but they painted it over the color um, of the senior members of uh, Samurai Clan. I, I think it was the, the Mori from Kobe. Um, and they look incredibly fierce in kimono and their hair thrown up and top knots and things. Um, and the date on it is very, very late. I think it's 1851, but it's just before Japan was forced to open it. And I think that's a very nice crystallization of culture just on the page. This is almost the last moment this photograph would have been taken. The other, <coughs> the other interesting image was not taken by a Japanese photographer at all, it was actually taken by William Gilbert as a Yobo Sullivan. And he took a wonderful picture of the waitress at the Japanese show village in Knightsbridge. Um, and she, she was a waitress in the tea shop, um, and she trained his actors in how to move and dance and dress for the production of the Pardo. Um, but he says they had terrible trouble with her because she didn't really speak English. She could only say six months each. <laughs> because she worked in a teacher with six months each. And all of the cast of the Pardo could say was Sayonara. <laughs> So, and, but there is a picture of her, and he took it, and it's you can find it on Wikipedia. So I think it's very well known, but I don't think anyone knows her name, so I just make one up her. She's in it. Anything else? Um, I'm really looking forward to reading what you've read out. That's okay. Um, so, this is a bit of a half full question, so it's, um, <coughs> I wonder, setting off the book in the 1980s, how did you decide what kind of language people would speak in terms of the, the dialogue that you want it to be a more modern sounding something that we relate to or to be trying to make it so that it is actually how we use English. Okay, so it's modernized. It is not at all in Victorian uh, I almost want to call it dialect. It wasn't in Victorian English. Um, and the reason for that um, I think a lot of people disagree with me on this, but I think that particularly as soon as you start using Victorian English in a Victorian novel, you are in very real danger of losing immediacy. And the reason for that is, is not just that the meanings of the words have shifted slightly, and it's not to do with the bother of taking out Americanisms, so I don't mind that at all, <laughs> even though it is a bother. <laughs> I find the problem with it is, Victorian English still exists today, but it's very high registered English. If someone is, is very, is very, very, um, I don't want to say posh, but if they use a very high register, like, so if you listen to kind of Stephen Bright, Bright, he almost sounds like he would have gone on for a while. Like, that is the kind of English we associate Victorian English and Victorian words with now. And that's a problem if you want to write about somebody who is not of the world from that period. Now, of course, people from uh, in kind of blue collar jobs and white collar jobs, of course, would have used this same diction. And we know, interestingly, like, for example, the word damn was a, a lot worse then than it is now. They were going to blank it out, even in newspaper articles, which maybe best. Um, that would have been quite an insult to say to somebody in Victorian England. Now, now we don't really read it like that. And that's a problem because. If you write a novel like that, your characters are in terrible danger of standing far more strength than, of course, they actually fit. And it's, of course, you can try and hand it up with content with, with a narration of what they feel, but actually what they say is always going to be less visible than if you can translate it into one language. And I, I think that this, this argument works more the further back in time you go as well. Uh, English is a language that changes a lot and quickly. 
if it's impractical to write in our language now. It's impractical to write in short theory in English now, even. Of course, there are many people who will read it, um, but your audience now is, and you're in, in huge danger of annoying people who read it, which, which isn't always a bad thing, but I don't want to be annoyed the entire time. It's, it's not that it's, of course, it's hard to write. You'd have to be a proper biologist to write it. It's about reading and about reading, losing your immediacy, things like that. Um, on the other side of that argument, the complete flip side, there was a book recently that's done really well um, by a guy called Kingsman. Uh, he wrote a book called The Wake, when you read it. If you're at all interested in using historical fiction and historical fiction, read The Wake, because it's in simplified old English. <coughs> and it looks, it, he doesn't use the, the old English words that we now don't have that have died out, but he does use everything that we would recognize, and a few things besides as well. It reads very convincingly as well. But one of the things that I found when I was reading it was that, again, he lost an immediacy. Even though this thing is almost that is, yeah, it really depends on whether your plot is going to be art driven or whether it's going to be driven by style and kind of beautiful literary language. And if it's the former, it's very, very worth considering modernizing the fiction. That was a lot of questions. <laughs> Uh, um, questions for you. Of course. Um, the first one is um, when you went to Japan, you didn't have any um, knowledge of the culture or the language of the city, so it must have been a really steep learning curve to learn the language and also start researching a uh, historical novel, which as you say, you wanted it to be something accurate. So, um, my first question is simply. Um, what kind of materials did you have to have in your system? It must be incredibly hard to read them because you have people who help to read them and perhaps you don't know the check. Maybe the final version of this book for anything that would be very inaccurate. First question. The second question is a very simple question. Um, I really enjoyed listening to your insights of development um, and culture and so on. And have you thought of writing something about this thing in your life? Like a memoir? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so. So the question one was, how would you learn to write a text? There is actually a lot of information available in English, just because there was there were things like the Japan Times, so they're publishing things about Japan in English, which is incredibly useful. But the other thing um, that I did, in kind of a much more haphazard and less accurate way, is that I just asked everyone who I could possibly ask about Japanese history. Um, a lot of the teachers at school. At the language school were really accommodating and they were they were very good at really kind of chopping down the Japanese until it was a level that I could understand. So after about uh, about six months I could start asking meaningful questions like, like what was the name of this person? Am I getting this right? Did this happen then? That that kind of thing was, was really useful. Um, once I could read a bit more I can't read fluently in Japanese, of course, but what I can do is cards on Google. And there are things that are readily available if you type it in, in Japanese that kind of aren't so much in English. What I'm researching at the moment um, is another book that's set in Japan. This, this is going to kind of answer your second question. Um, it's set around the promulgation of the major constitution. And it was very difficult to find out anything about it in English. But as soon as I typed it in the Japanese, lots and lots of oil paintings and images came up. Um, and it was images of the actual moment that the Prime Minister presents the Emperor with the paper of the Constitution. It's things like what the Empress was wearing, like oh, kind of wonderful things. Um, so even though I'm not fluent, being able to just recognise what I didn't want was also really useful. Um, to answer your second question, there's going to be another book, and it's going to be about the same characters but they've moved to Tokyo. Um, I really don't like writing about my own experiences and myself because I kind of have to live that. And I write for escapism in the same way that I watch TV. I always watch science fiction and fantasy. I love Game of Thrones because that's not what I live at the time. Um, but a lot of what I experienced in Japan, the kind of, the kind of things that I was doing, <coughs> the kind of things that I was doing, are definitely pouring into that that new book. So, so in a way, yeah, it is. A, it's, Oh, it's, it's a very heavily disguised memoir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, to do justice to no one arranged me. <laughs> 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 do you please do? Yeah, I, I had a 
friend from Shimano State, who told me she got a professorship and a flower event. For a number of years, she used to go to a college or, and she got told, I was kind of like you, you know, this even not to say it's not genuine, but it's, this is a cultural mismatch that we don't think flower arrangement needs to be the professor. Anyway, <laughs> the good thing about it that I learned a few tips that I could show off to my friends here. You know, when you get bunches of flowers, how you trim it, how you do the colors, uh, so whatever. So anything cultural that it looks at first all when you compare it to your own tradition, to my own tradition, it's small and you feel, why you do this? It's so silly. But after what you see, it's rooted into tradition that it has a meaning and as well as the expression. So what what all the things apart from our tradition that we feel that you want it at first and then later you feel uh, you kind of appreciate it or you want to appreciate it later. Yeah, I think another one was perhaps the Ida, which is um is almost the same as Kendo, I think, <coughs> except that they use real swords. And in the stuff that I watch never gets each other. So it was almost like yoga but with swords. And that was way more boring than I thought it would be. And and I was looking at it when, when, at the time I was observing this EID club and I was so bored, it lasted for two hours. And I remember sitting there thinking, I can see <coughs> that this is an extrapolation of the kind of training regime that perhaps real samurai once went through, but it's ridiculously ritualized now. You know, a real samurai would kind of laughing at them and he'd be missing. Um, but it's the, it's the same as my whole kind of tea ceremony realization, I think. It's just about process and not about outcome at all. It's this kind of, and watching it, and watching my memories of it, um, it was this kind of beautiful, dynamic thing. And it was more like dance than sword training, even though it kind of gets explained to you in terms of sword training. And I think kind of one of the reasons that often, I feel like especially clueless English people, have so many misconceptions about it, is that it's, um, my Japanese wasn't good enough for anybody to explain to me, like, this is what it is. All that anyone could say to me, but I mean, for ages, I, I wasn't even slightly intermediately functionally fluent until I was almost leaving. No one could explain to me that it was anything except exercise with a sword. Like, there's, that I have no kind of metaphysical vocabulary at this point in Japanese. So there, so there is a problem just with communication. It's, it's difficult to explain anything that isn't a noun, really. Um, and I think that really feeds into it. You have to watch it and eventually just come to this understanding of what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have a task? No. Sure, why not? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now it takes a bit off. How do you feel about the balance that you've done that right now? Uh, <laughs> I, it, it's very, very daunting. Um, and I think, um, oh, yeah, there, there was this kind of horrifying statistic that somebody sent me. There, there were six of us out there at the same time, and somebody sent me a statistic that said, in order to become fluent in Japanese, you need to study at 80,000 hours, which is about 20 years worth of study, studying it every day. Whereas um, a language as close to English like Dutch would be more like 4,000 hours, um, which is only a couple of years. Um, I think that, well, yeah, one of the reasons that, for the 20,000 hours, I think, is just a part of the writing system. It doesn't take 20, uh, that long to understand what people are saying to you on a kind of day they say that you know, also, like, you learn it pretty quickly and we were functioning in everyday life very well after a year, I think. So that's the same. So I would, I would call that kind of functional fluency, if not kind of literally. Um, <coughs> but with, with Japanese, I think the problem part of it is, is the writing system. If you want to learn to write, you learn a new kanji for almost every new word. So you're almost learning two languages at the same time. You're learning this kind of tutorial thing and you're learning to speak. And often they just don't really seem to link up. The pronunciation is very, very different from So I think that really slows down the whole process. Just the fact that if you want to read a newspaper, you can spend years of it. Um, that's really difficult. Whereas we, and particularly um, in the West, we grew, up, we grew up with these very, very convenient 
alphabetical systems which divide the language into kind of 26 or 50 perfect bits from which we construct everything. Um, whereas, of course, Asian languages can fall along very immediately. The other thing is, it's 80,000 hours from the point of view of an English person. Of course, it doesn't take 80,000 hours in your place. But it was so frustrating at school that as we kind of went up the advancement levels, well, I mean, we start out with kind of lots of real foreigners, like French, German, everything. By the time we were kind of getting up to like upper intermediate level, advanced level, it was it was one British person and a room full of Chinese people who were getting it very, very fast. So they already know this. Um, just incredibly frustrating, and it makes you feel like a class idiot for quite a long time. Um, and it's just that it's not that Japanese as a language is impossible in itself. I don't think it is. I think mean, it's actually incredibly logical. You haven't had fewer tenses and the use of tenses in what I think is probably a more sensible way. So of itself, it's not difficult. It's that if you grow up with English, <coughs> English is a completely different language. You think about things in a different way. If you come from that and then try and do Japanese, that's the problem, I think. It's not that it's just inherently awful at all. Thank you. Great. Well, we discussed all kinds of topics there. Um, and I'm sure we'll discuss a few more over a glass of wine now um, downstairs in our gallery floor. I just want to mention that um, Natasha does have some copies of the book, about 15 or so, I think. And it says on the back here the recommended price is £12.99, which is actually what I paid on Saturday. Um, now, I'm afraid I haven't got beyond chapter three yet, so I can't tell you. I've only met the watchmaker yet. He hasn't, he hasn't, he hasn't actually appeared. Um, but it certainly looks very beautiful uh, on the outside. And uh, because it's easier with changes, I'm going to say for £10 um, this evening. So if you would like one, just ask her and maybe she'll even sign it for you. Um, so thank you very much indeed for a really interesting presentation. And I know we're all dying to be able to teach you the book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So normally members of the audience are not the speaker at this point, but we must do that. We must get you downstairs, um, not least because that's where the books are. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, you must be alive. That's great. Uh, so, uh, yeah. 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 Y